All right. Thank you for joining the Dataversity webinar today. Strategy is where data architecture and data governance collide, sponsored by IBM. It is the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Ed Online, with Dr. Peter Aiken. As you join the webinar, you will be muted. We will be collecting questions throughout the presentation by the Q&A section of your screen. If you'd like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just to note, Zoom chat defaults send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted. Uh, we'll be collecting questions by the Q&A section. To open the Q&A or the chat panel, the icons for those features are in the bottom middle of your screen. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within a couple of business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we will be recording and likewise, we'll send a link to the recording of this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me pass it to Scott for a word from our sponsor, IBM. Take it away, Scott. Thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, happy to be here. My name is Scott Broca. I, I lead uh, our product team at, at IBM for our data and AI offerings uh, uh, across our portfolio. Um, really want to just start by uh, giving all the data people a call out, right? Uh, as we as we ultimately uh, talk to a lot of clients about uh, you know how they're going to be successful with analytical and, and AI use cases, you know the the criticality and the importance of a data foundation. Uh, is is ultimately where we start, right? And and so it's a it's a great topic today to dive into data architecture and data governance because you know there's there's no debating uh, you know the criticality of how how we want to help clients set that foundation for uh, ultimately you know all the upstream applications and, and initiatives that they're working through. Um, you know, it, it's it's funny because it, there's there's no debating anymore. Like the the impact and the opportunity that that generative AI is is up unlocking for enterprises. You know, Goldman Sachs uh, quantifies it as having the potential to raise GDP by seven percent, and it's you know it's a pretty deep economical impact and gets a lot of board of directors really excited. But I think at the end of the day, like as we start to unpack how clients are going to take advantage of this type of technology, the importance of a data platform really starts to shine through because no matter you know how many enterprises ultimately start working this, in, in our statistics, we see about eighty percent of enterprises already trying to use in some way uh, foundation models, like the, just the very fact that you're trying to embrace AI is no longer a competitive advantage. Like effectively what we are encouraging clients to lean into is what makes them different and unique. And that's that's ultimately their data. So I wanna emphasize a couple of truths of uh, what journey to AI and, and analytics entail and, and talk, uh, talk about a few of these. First, like my, my belief is that clients are better served by pursuing a strategy of of open, flexible, you know, fit for purpose models that that align to use cases that they're ultimately trying to solve. Uh, this means that like trying to solve for a, a single model or or thinking it's you know a one model world is is not reality. You know, reality is the the mixture of you know how we're going to bring uh, clients' data, whether it's fine tuning, whether it's you know retrieval augmented generation patterns or rag patterns, whether it's you know trying to help with different model selection. You know, we need to ensure that we can bring the the right data to to the problem. Uh, second, it's it's no secret that that hybrids won, right? And you know, whether your data is on premises, whether it's behind a firewall, you know, in a warehouse, a lake house, you know, message hubs or buses or in cloud, like we have to ensure that we run AI and data tooling where the data actually resides. You know, what's interesting is I, IBM actually surveyed a bunch of top data and AI leaders, and we found that nearly half of them believe that generative AI can't be trusted, right? And, and trust is something that it's really hard to earn like and, and really easy to lose. And so the role that governance plays in, you know, how we can help organizations with protection against bias, you know, fairness, drift, and and probably more, most importantly, you know, the, the conjunction of how important data is in used in, in, in AI, like this, this is really top of mind. And then lastly, like, Data being the main differentiator for clients, like this is ultimately the critical factor for how accurate or successful a lot of these projects are, right? Uh, and, and so being sure that we can uh, maximize the ability for, for clients to establish that foundation is, is of most uh, importance to us. Um, but if we're honest, like as we work with organizations, the majority of them are struggling with the basics of data management, 
right? So whether it's accessibility challenges, whether it's you know data volume or complexity, the you know scope of of you know ultimately data they can use, you know we're trying to work with clients to to lay out what we call a, a data fabric architecture, which is trying to connect the consumers of data with the producers of data. Right? And, we're, and we're trying to ensure that we can start to knock down the barriers of data discovery and, and classification, uh, linkage of technical and business metadata together with you know, things like data different integration patterns and, and styles of integration of how you can actually connect to and work with data. Uh, so you know, at, at its core, you know, what we're trying to do is, is help clients you know, identify and organize the, the data that they already have and, and make the consumption of data and data products ultimately easier uh, that clients can you know, discover, protect, and, and access data in a really responsible way. So hopefully this helps you know, set some of the context for what we've been working on with, with clients and, and the importance and, and criticality of, of data architectures, but I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Mark, and really excited for the session today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an Acknowledged Data Management Authority, is an Associate Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, President of DAMA International, and Associate Director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in 30 countries. Among his 10 books, uh, well, 11 now, I think, right, Peter, are the first on CDOs, the case for data leadership, the first for describing the use of monetization of data for profit and good, the first on a modern strategic data thinking, and international recognition has resulted in an intensive schedule of events worldwide. Peter also hosts the longest running DM webinar series hosted by Dataversity.net, this webinar series right here. From 1999, before Google, before data was big and before data science, he founded Data Blueprint, a consulting firm that helped more than 150 organizations leverage data for profit, improvement, competitive advantage, and operational efficiencies. His latest venture is Anything Awesome, and with that, let me turn everything over to my friend Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome, Dr. Aiken. Hello, Mark. It's always good to be with you, Scott. Uh, very nice presentation. And hopefully you'll be joining us at the end of the hour from now to have our little Q&A session as we go forward, too. Uh, on this. Uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Mark, in the sense of lots and lots of books and just getting one more piece out here. This is number 13. So if you're interested in the monetization components here, this is a fairly comprehensive how-to look at uh, monetization. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about strategy, which is where data architecture and data governance uh, collide. And the real key, I want to emphasize that this uh, Scott's presentation here really dovetails very nicely into this. He talked about the integration that's necessary between several functions. If you all are familiar with the DM BOC, the Data Management Body of Knowledge that DEMA International uh, puts out, and we're working on our third version uh, at this point right now, uh, you'll know that the best way to use that is not to use any one particular ed wedge at a point in time, but to use them in conjunction with each other. And uh, as Scott was saying, it requires sort of a coordinated effort uh, to get all of these things here. We're going to take a look at architecture and governance in particular, and how strategy focuses both of those efforts. The program today is going to talk about a little bit of introduction with some confounding characteristics of data, and even an understanding that's really poor as a result outside of the group that's on this call. Don't get me wrong. You're on this call because you've somehow decided to take some of your valuable time and learn a little bit more about data. And both of us appreciate it a whole lot. Uh, we're going to define data governance and talk about the need for an elevator pitch and the increasing costs that uh, Scott, again, was alluding to in the organizing data debt uh, component of that. Uh, then talking about an adaptive rather than a prescriptive approach. Then we'll define data architecture. Again, it is ubiquitous, but it's not well understood. And if, of course, it's not understood, it's impossible to make value from it. And uh, talk about improvements focused on strategy, and uh, really, it's just impossible to use it if you don't understand it. And then we'll see how strategic focus improves coordination of both of those activities. And then, as I mentioned before, at the top of the hour, we'll come back around, uh, invite Scott back on, join us, and uh, you guys get to uh, ask us a bunch of questions, which allows us to make this uh, webinar better and better as you look at your questions. So let's uh, dive into this and uh, start talking about some unique properties. Uh, I don't think I'm 
telling you guys anything new by saying data is the most powerful, underutilized, and poorly managed organizational asset. It is nearly unlimited. It is free to make copies, which uh, our good friend uh, Doug Laney has said makes it non-rivalrous. And of course, it's impossible to clean up if you spill it. But you probably weren't aware that 80% of organizational data falls into the category of redundant obsolete or trivial. And that means if it's of unknown quality, it makes it very difficult to use anything in that context. And the reason for that is precisely uh, the fault of the college and educational system of which I'm unfortunately or fortunately a part of, uh, unfortunately, because I'm uh, tarred with the same brush, brush but I'm uh, hopefully pushing this education out here. But outside of IT, most people don't have any idea what they're doing with it. And within IT, we teach you exactly one skill typically, which is how to build a new Oracle database. If you, if there's one skill we do not need more of on planet earth, it is how to build a new database. Uh, so not to say that it's an unimportant skill, but there's so much more to data than all of this. And it's really inconsistently taught over there. And more importantly, it's missing the business context, the value proposition in here, but probably even more important than those other three points that I've made is that every work group in your organization is a knowledge-based work group. They are knowledge workers, and they are having to relearn data by themselves, which I then bring into the picture my friend Wally Easton here. Wally is a uh, piano player here who's been taught... How to play the piano, but he probably wasn't told that quality is his number one criteria around this. And this makes it to be a, a tremendous challenge because your organizations have gotten similarly creative with their approaches to data. And having a standardized approach to it will absolutely help to speed things up, both in terms of onboarding, getting people up to speed, diagnosing problems, but also in terms of day-to-day -day productivity, because there has been confusion about data in major, major ways uh, around this. IT thinks that data is a business problem, and if they can connect to the server, my job is done, is their basic attitude. And business thinks that IT is managing the data adequately. After all, what else would the CIO be doing? And of course, the answer is, a lot of other things. CIOs have tremendous responsibility. Data has been typically one of them. We have a new class of data leaders out there called chief data officers. Uh, they're still sort of figuring out their groundwork, and that's why data leadership is a, a big focus uh, on all of this. And data, as a result, has slipped into a gigantic chasm between business and IT. And what it's our job as professionals to replace the uh, a chasm with a, a much more collaborative type of an environment because the Wally Eastons of the world are creating lots and lots of data debt, which slows progress, which decreases quality, which goes through and increases the costs of our organizational processing and presents greater risks to the organization. And this data debt likely involves skills that you're not aware that you even need to have. I'll give you a very specific example here, even though it's a couple of years old, it has not been solved. Uh, American Airlines and United Airlines uh, were both valued in 2020 per this Forbes article at 6 billion and 9 billion US dollars respectively. Uh, however, the data in the American Airlines program is valued at $30 billion. And the data that was in the United Airlines program was valued at $22 billion. And so the question both CEOs face on an ongoing basis is how do you unlock the rest of that value in there? Because they would take their market cap of their companies, uh, doubling it in at least both of those cases uh, to try and, and, and produce more result. This is an astounding number. This is not just happening in the airline industry. This is just an example from Forbes magazine uh, that here, but it, we see it in industry after industry. And as, as uh, Mark mentioned at the top, I've, I've looked with more than uh, 500 different 
data management practices in organizations, and they are uh, all uniformly challenged in many ways uh, on this. Here's a survey from our colleague, Randy Bean, and the reference for it is right down at the bottom of your screen there. This is the first time uh, in a long time that we've actually had more people uh, driving innovation with data than not, so that's good. But the rest of these are, are similarly poor examples. 41% of these thousands of companies that he surveyed year after year are competing on analytics. 40% of them are managing data as a business asset. One in four are creating a data-driven culture and one in five have forged a data-driven culture. But the most important numbers that come out of this survey come out of the same survey year after year after year in 2018. The question was asked of these same individuals, again, thousands of companies around the world, are your problems mainly technology focused? Or are they people and problem focused? And you can see in 2019, the answer was Pareto analysis. 80-20 rule out this. Uh, 2019, these were the numbers, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. Uh, again, the question is, what resource do you have in your organization that helps to address these issues? And the answer, of course, is data governance in there. Now, I mentioned the DIMBOC, the Data Management Body of Knowledge, where we've divided this world up into these high wedges, of course, with data governance focusing on it. And again, looking at data architecture management, and in this case, for this program, data governance as well. The idea here is that working in conjunction, most of these are better. It's not good to try all of these at once, but it's also not good to try individually. So look at this as a combination of things that you would need to apply in order to do this. When you look at this, this really starts to focus in on, and typically we find the best balance is sort of a three-legged stool, perfecting it in three areas. So if you're doing a warehouse operation, for example, in the cloud, uh, you might want to look at architecture management, governance, and, and uh, warehousing simultaneously. The real challenge that we found around this is most people figure moving to the cloud means they don't have to pay attention to architecture, and I contend that just the opposite is true. In order to come up with a true data strategy, you need to have an architecture because all architectures have strategy as an integral component of this. So I've mentioned data governance. Let's dive in a little bit further and talk about the need for an elevator pitch, the increasing costs around this, and a adaptive rather than a prescriptive approach. So as I mentioned before, data is not broadly or widely understood because it's a big topic. And just like the blind individuals approaching the elephant, you also have people who come to data with different perspectives as well, thinking it's a dashboard or it's statistic or it's pipes, all of which are correct. The challenge is, though, that we then have what our friend Tom Redman calls hidden data factories. And these hidden data factories are when Department B gets tired of correcting, uh, of trying to get Department A to correct its work products that come to it that are data focused and just starts doing it on their own. Department C having the same downstream effect from Department B also gets tired of correcting Department B's pieces. And of course, customers end up with the same kind of results here. It's really a challenge and these hidden data factories exist in all of our organizations. One of the goals should be to find these and eliminate them to the degree that we possibly can because they are ubiquitous in too many organizations. And not having a handle on this, poor data manifests itself as multifaceted organizational challenges. What that means is that one data challenge at the center of your processing from a data-centric perspective is always filtered through one or more IT systems or business challenges. And until you connect the dots all the way around, you won't know and understand that fixing one data challenge at the center can actually help organizations in a major way and the root cause analysis of these problems is a major part of data governance initiatives that needs to happen all the way. In addition to that, if we look at the situation, we are going to get much better results from having a dedicated team that deploys a repeatable process and develop sustained organizational skills instead of everybody putting in 10% off the side of their desk. 
it allows us to create much more focused areas. So let's do a couple quick definitions here. Corporate governance is the relationship of the organization to society. Jamie Dimon, who was in the paper uh, recently on this, has uh, done a lot of work around that. Just Google his name and you'll find some very good uh, uh, ideas that are going forward in that area. Uh, of course, if corporate guidance existed, we must have an IT guidance in there. And next, I'm going to put up here what I would call our seven definitions of data governance, um, and one of them including from our own data management body of knowledge. But what I want you to imagine is, is trying to explain this in an elevator pitch. I'm going to pick on just one of them here. Uh, you know, the boss looks over at you and says, hey, Peter, reading my badge, you work for me and you're doing data governance. I know what is it? And if I respond with the execution and enforcement of authority over management of data assets and the performance of data functions, the boss is not really going to understand there. It's important that you have an elevator pitch. Here's the one that I like, uh, which again, is the idea the boss looks at you and says, what's going on? You've got a couple of bits of minutes to, to get this elevator to the top and, and you know, convince the boss you're not an absolute idiot by giving them some sort of definition that they want to hear more about. Definition that I like to use then is managing data with guidance. Everybody understands that. And it also begs the question immediately, would you want your soul non-depletable, non-degrading, durable, strategic asset managed without guidance? The answer is, of course, no. Now, this definition is a good start, but it is absolutely not enough in order to learn what goes into here. And the reason for that is because when we're talking a little bit further up the food chain, rather than just to knowledge workers, but instead talking with corporate management, it's not really about managing data with guidance. It's about managing data decisions with guidance. People are often unaware they are making data decisions in there. For example, setting an arbitrary implementation date for your new CRM of January 1st, 2025, because that's the day it seems like it ought to go live and you'd like to have the whole year done that way. Uh, almost always dooms your new CRM initiative to being run with poor data. And that's a data decision that is unknown. Data governance is important in that it costs organization millions each year in productivity, in siloed and redundant efforts, in poorly thought out hardware and software purchases, in delayed decision making when they have inadequate decision, and that they are reactive instead of proactive initiatives. I have been able in many, many instances to help organizations save over a billion and a half dollars. And most importantly, the number is 20 to 40% of all IT spending can be reduced through improved data governance. When you look at this and what's happening here, this is the uh, sort of bad data decision spiral because lots of organizations are making bad business decisions based on the data. Uh, again, the business decision makers are not data knowledgeable as the technical decision makers are also not data knowledgeable. This leads to bad data decisions, poor treatment of organizational assets and poor quality data, which in turn leads to poor organizational outcomes. We're in a situation in many organizations where lather, rinse, and repeat. And uh, I'll sample Morgan Freeman there just to make sure because he says this is wrong so well uh, in that. And it is. A specific example, I mentioned CRM before, but one of Salesforce's biggest problems, Salesforce is really good software. But if we install Salesforce by that January 1st, 2025 deadline I mentioned a second ago, it can be really problematic because there's absolutely every incentive on the part of IT to make sure that the, the um, software is installed correctly. And again, you're not really installing it, it's cloud-based stuff, right? But you know what I'm saying. Uh, and, and this leads to then we fill up really good software, Salesforce, with really poor quality data. And hence, that people look at this and say, well, therefore, Salesforce doesn't work as well as it should. Well, it's not Salesforce's fault that you've given it garbage in because Salesforce can only, as a result of that, reduce garbage out. Now, continuing on with our theme of data governance, there are lots of things that you should look at. These are from our data management body of knowledge. I'm not gonna walk through them with you because they're really good checklists for you to take a look at. Similarly, here are a series of primary deliverables. Once again, 
not going to walk through them. Here are roles and responsibilities, scorecards, and a checklist that many organizations have. Here are some components that go into all of this. These are puzzle pieces that you have to put together. And when I say put together, it can be, in fact, quite a puzzle to do this. But what I find most organizations doing is spending way too much time up at the front end of this and instead looking at what they should do, which is look at these things as a way of evolving. So here's, again, the series of checklists that we have here. And most organizations spend way too much effort doing this because you're only going to do this once. And then once you've done it, once you set it up, you now start to do the more important part here, which is executing against it. And this I think should look to a lot of you like plan, do, check, act. It's much better to get better at the right-hand side of this diagram and not invest as much in the process of getting started than it is to, in fact, look at the process of getting improvements and repeating in that context in here. Now, it's important, however, to make sure that data in your organization works well, because what we'd really liken it to is the Hans Christian Andersen conversation on the princess on the pea. There's the pea at the bottom of a large number of mattresses, and the princess, as a result of this imperfection, is sleepless. Data imperfections will stick with you for a very, very long time. It's not just a matter of undoing the reputational challenges that you've had around it, but many other things as well. Uh, failure to understand the role of data governance regarding software and existing services locks in imperfections that are there for the life of the application. It restricts additional data investment benefits, decreases organizational data leverage, and as I mentioned before, accounts for 20 to 40% of IT budgets migrating, converting, and improving the data. Lack of data governance causes everything to take longer, cost more, deliver less, and present greater risk. Thank you, Tom. DeMarco for the wonderful words many years ago. So we've talked a little bit about data governance. Now let's move on to data architecture. Again, data architecture is ubiquitous. If you have an organization, you have a data architecture. The only question is how well is it understood and making sure that improvements, evolutionary improvements to your data architecture are practically focused on supporting your strategy because of course you cannot use what is not understood. Just at the most basic level, architecture is about things and the function of those things and how those things interact. Well, again, whatever that happens to be in terms of the interaction is necessary and should be done ideally before, but typically in most organizations is evolving. All organizations have some combination of these architectures in their organization. And yet, if the, uh, excuse me, right, ho hum, it's a technical committee and nobody really understands what they're doing in here, that can be a very big challenge. Now, I see that one in 10 organizations tries to manage one or more of these architectures on a regular basis, formal basis. And that's important because if your organization does start to do this, you're in the minority. Remember, you're only on this webinar because you figure that data is something you need to learn a little bit more about. The vast majority of the world does not have that in their minds and is not trying to learn more about this. So we take these and we look and say, architecture is here whether you like it or not. All organizations have data architectures. The question is, are some of them understood and better documented and therefore useful to the organization than others are? Of course, if your organization is high on this list, that's wonderful, and you are in that top 10% of organizations, it does give your organization an opportunity to achieve a sustained competitive advantage. Now, I've looked for ways of describing the importance of architecture for a long time, and I found this older BMW commercial uh, in here, which the motto of the story is, of course, you cannot architect after you have implemented something. This is one of the main reasons we're having major challenges around getting AI and that 7% that Scott mentioned uh, out of organizations, because you 
have to have your AI architecture be explainable. And if you want it to be explainable, you have to build it in before you field it rather than after you field it. Again, my favorite example of this is if I was the architect of the Great Pyramid uh, and the Pharaoh said to me, Peter, uh, unfortunately, I'd like a swimming pool at the bottom of this. If you don't know, the uh, the uh, Great Pyramid is built on shifting sands out of very large rocks. So the chances of me retrofitting, adding in a swimming pool in the basement after it is built are zero, and my head will come off as a result of that. Now, let's talk about how these components are expressed as architectures. We tend to organize things in a reverse decomposition method. We take details and organize them into larger components. And this leads to intricacies in the way we are doing our construction here. These larger components are organized into models and that leads to dependencies. Uh, again, just thinking of it from a reference master data transaction data perspective, we need to have a master detail of a charge card number if I'm going to charge things to that charge card. Uh, again, it's a dependency that exists and that those models are organized into architectures, but that all organizers should be guided by some official overt purposefulness. Faster, better, cheaper, or less risk is what most organizations start with. You, of course, want to go down from there and refine it a little bit and just say, hey, cheaper, right? That could be an answer, but it may not be right. So in the data world, attributes are organized into things for our intricacy pieces. Entities and objects are organized into the models for dependencies. And the models, again, are organized into architectures for purposefulness. Notice I've put up on this particular slide an example of an entity, excuse me, an attributes list of thing, thing ID, thing description, thing status, thing sex to be assigned, thing reservation reason in there. And then I made a little data model there for dependencies. But why are there no examples of models into architectures? And that's because they're oftentimes very complex. So here's an example of it. We tend not to use them this way. Uh, what we really need to do is have some form of uh, a, a case tool support so that we can actually manage the metadata that's involved in this uh, on it. Uh, again, just a little quick sort of side piece, but uh, somebody put up a little piece that said, hey, here, start with data, and then we've got information so we understand a little more about it. Knowledge is the connections between them. Insight is where we can get from one place to another. Wisdom says we can repeat that process. Impact is where we have. And of course, then we have conspiracy theories that get to the whole thing. That's a really bad definition. Let me give you a better one here. Uh, it has to do with the number 42. Some of you may be familiar with the number 42 as a component of a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, I've been babbling about this topic for more than 35 years. And every audience, at least one person, understands that when I say 42, they know I mean the answer to the life, the universe, and everything. Those of you that don't know wouldn't be aware that a subplot in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy turns out that the white mice and the dolphin, in Douglas Adams' perspective, are running the world with us as the experiment and they set a gigantic supercomputer to run on the problem of what is the meaning of life. It runs for 300 centuries and comes back and says, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Well, what I've done there is I've paired a random fact with a meaning on this. 42, of course, also is Jackie Robinson's jersey and the number, uh, excuse me, the name of his wonderful movie uh, about his life and times uh, that was there. Or if we want to get really particular about it. 42 is my age 23 years ago. So the question, can Peter drink alcoholic beverages in the Commonwealth of Virginia? The answer would be yes. Now I've given you three random facts as paired with the fact 42 and paired them different ways. That is what data is. Each fact is combined with one or more meanings. So 42 can be the meaning of life, the universe, and everything Jackie Robinson's jersey, or whether or not Peter is in fact allowed to drink adult beverages in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The problem is we have a lot of data, and what we really need to do is identify the subset of data that is actually useful for us. Uh, that's one of the major components, major purposes of data management within there. And if we want to go the next step up and say, what's the difference between that and information? The answer is that data is provided in response to a request. If somebody asks for something, it now turns into information. These are objective facts. There is no 
ambiguity about it. And it's really, really useful definition. You can see already that you can have data without information, but you can't have information without data uh, on that. And if we want to get to the last level, intelligence, which is also known over the years as wisdom or knowledge uh, in there, it's how is that information used strategically in order to describe these. These definitions have been around for a long time, but again, are not well taught in the college and university situation. And consequently, it's been very difficult. But this even of itself is an information architecture, in this case, made up of metadata, uh, allowing us to use these. Let's talk now to the purposefulness of all of this data organized into architecture. Well, how is data structure and architecture in general used to support strategy? Well, the easy thing to do is consider the opposite question. Were your systems explicitly designed to be integrated or otherwise work together? If not, what are the likelihood that they will happen to do so? And the answer is, of course, not at all. They cannot be helpful as long as their structure is unknown. So let's look at a couple different things. We may try to achieve effectiveness and efficiency goals. If my goal here as a restaurant owner, I'm going to put a context on you here and say that the plates up there in the upper right hand corner of the slide represent a absolute different dish for each individual uh, plate that's served. Now, if I serve peach pie for dessert, I have a peach pie dish versus an apple pie dish. Uh, that may be important for the aesthetics of the organization, but if my goal is efficiency, that means when I break a peach pie dish, I have to go in and find a peach pie dish. Whereas if my goal is uh, to maximize speed, in this case, we make every dish exactly the same and I simply grab the next dish. That provides for additional dexterity in the organizations given that. Again, architectures are hugely important from a purposefulness and data should not be the sand that gums up our organizational architecture and its processing. If we have sand in the gears, it means that everything is going to cost more, take longer, have less of quality and increase risk around all of this. This all combines into something that I call the data sandwich metaphor, which is the idea that high point automation is really critical for most of our organizations. And then we have varying amounts of literacy and data supply and use of standards in the organization. If we can help to smooth these out and make the data literacy and the data supply both complement the standard data, we can get them to work in conjunction much better than most organizations are able to do it. And I had to go all the way to India to see this quote, which is a Deming quote, hung over the cash register at this tea farm in India. The quote was, quality engineering and architecture work products do not happen accidentally. What a great thing to see over a cash register in India. But it's absolutely true. And of course, if we add the word data to all of these, it's equally as true in order to look at things. Now, I'm talking to you right now from my uh, uh, abode, which is a picture of it right here in Montpelier, Virginia. And I'm what's called a horse husband. That means uh, part of the deal was uh, we built a barn, cleared the land, and uh, uh, this is a picture a couple of pictures, in fact, of the barn. Why, you might ask, am I doing just the barn? Well, I borrowed money from the bank to build the barn. And before I could proceed any further with construction, the barn required that I get a foundation inspection. So these pictures are part of the documentation of the fact that my barn had passed a foundation inspection. This is just good business sense. If I built the barn with a poor foundation, then I would lose my investment and the bank would probably not have the loan paid back, but there is no IT equivalent to this. So when we look at architectures from an overall perspective, we see that we can define it as a structure of database, not database, data-based assets that are supporting the implementation of organizational strategies. And most information architectures are not helpful because they are not well understood. So the question is, how can organizations more effectively use their data architectures to support strategy implementation? When we use an information architecture, it means the application of data assets to improve their ability to support strategic organizational objectives. These can be assessed by the maturity of the data practices that are there and results in increased capacities, dexterity, and self-awareness 
on the part of the organization. As I mentioned before, if you're doing this, you're in one of 10, the top 10% organizations around this. And this is accomplished through the use of what we call data-centric development practices uh, around all this. So the question of how does an organization better achieve the use of its architecture? The answer is through continuous redevelopment. It's a koan. The starting point isn't the beginning. You're actually starting from an existing component in order to pull all of this together. These information architecture components must typically be re-engineered. Re-engineering is a formal term requiring you to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your existing architectural component and then use that information to inform the development of the next architectural component that you're putting in. It doesn't mean just buying a new piece of software. In fact, best practices in today's environment dictate that you should ask for any software provider, whether it is cloud-based or not, to show you a logical data model of the service that they're pro providing for you so that you can determine whether or not it is going to complement your existing architecture or whether it's going to make it more difficult in order to do this. This helps to use an iterative incremental approach, focusing on one component at a time and applying formal transformations to the process. So once again, we've defined data architecture. Now let's look at strategy as a way of tying both of these pieces together. Strategy as a word was not used at all in our literature until about 1950, when management consultants, including Peter Drucker, discovered the term and started coming up with a master plan. However, this approach to strategy made the strategy sound like a thing. And that's a real problem, because if we go back to the original definition of it as derived from the military, strategy means a pattern in a stream of decisions. And this pattern in there means that Strategy is much more of a process than it is a thing. There's a famous uh, Dwight Eisenhower quote where he says, planning is useless, excuse me, plans are useless, but planning is everything. And I think I agree with him in a major way on this particular piece. So your data strategy then is the highest level of data guidance that's available that focuses on data activities excuse me, it focuses data activities on business goal achievement. I get that wrong a lot of times. That's why I wrote it, right? Focuses data activities on business goal achievement. Really important that we are able to articulate this in terms that the business understands and provides guidance when faced with a stream of decisions or uncertainties. The data strategy most usefully articulates how data can be used to support the organizational strategy involving a balance of remediation and proactive type measures. Yes, you have to fix some old stuff before you can get to the new stuff, which is what everybody wants to do. <laughs> the wrong way to think about data strategy is that we have an organizational strategy and then an IT strategy and then a data strategy. Once again, this is the way most organizations have thought about it up until most recent times. Call from Morgan Freeman to give me that wonderful. This is wrong. This is wrong. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. He doesn't know I'm using him that way, but it's fair use uh, type thing. And he's absolutely correct as far as that goes. So the organizational strategy should drive both the IT strategy and the data strategy, but the data strategy probably has more influence over the IT strategy than the IT strategy has over the data strategy. Windows, for example, has now told us when Windows 10 is going to disappear. Does anybody think they're really going to get a strategic bump by going to Windows 11, other than perhaps the wonderful integrated uh, 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 abilities to no longer uh, have uh, be plagued by, uh, I shouldn't say no longer, but improved capabilities of virus protection and things like that. Uh, by the way, Bank of America and Delta, probably both of them could benefit from that. Let's look at strategy and governance in context. Again, our organizational strategy and data strategy should work hand in glove uh, in order to do this. What are the data assets doing to help organizational strategy? And that should be the main driver of data governance activities. How well is that data strategy working in there? And then the question, of course, we had our main resource from data governance, our data stewards in there. Uh, they again can look at 
you know, what's the most effective use of all of these components in here. Uh, once again, if I have an opportunity, and I'm often offered this when I'm working with organizations, where they'll say, sure, you can have 10% of 10 people. And I'll almost always turn that right around and say, nope, I want one full-time person because that full-time person is going to be thinking about data governance, uh, morning, noon, and night, shower, drive to work, whatever it is. And they're going to come up with a much better focus of what they're doing, whereas 10% is not going to be helpful in most organizations at all in order to look at this. Key to all of this, once again, is to make sure that these goals are expressed in specific business goals. No, we're not going to clean up the database. We're going to achieve higher targeting with our ads uh, in there. And that the language of data governance is metadata. And only by putting these two things together in front of the stewards can we really have a good focus around all of this. Of course, it also needs what we call a trusted catalog in place so that we can have these words recorded in the long term and make sure that everybody is singing off the same sheet of music. Now, let's talk a little bit about this reverse engineering component. Our model evolution is that we look at things from an as-is perspective and from a to be perspective, that is how they currently are and how we'd like them to be moving from the brown to the blue in this particular instance in here. However, there are dimensions of this as well. All of our model components fall also into the category of either validated or unvalidated models. If they haven't been validated, then you have a question mark and you're holding your fingers hoping that you have the right answers as opposed to being certain of that. And then we can also, once again, subdivide them in a different way into conceptual, logical, and physical models. When we look at these, as we're doing it, all model components fall into this area somewhere. And we start off with our as-is models. This is what we teach our students to do. They create a brand new uh, program by creating some requirements, then a model, and oftentimes the model produces some DDL, which is then turned into the physical database itself. Every model component can be mapped into a transformation in this framework, as is to be conceptual, logical, or physical, and validated versus unvalidated. Let's look at this process, though, for to be modeling on this case. And this is really much more important when we look at going forward. Most of the time, we're not spending a lot of time doing this. We're taking what and then how and then as built. But we spend only 20% of our effort building new things and 80% of our effort working on things that already exist, which means we should put more effort into reverse engineering. This reverse engineering exercise is really understanding the existing knowledge. Each system has some things that are good about it and some things that are bad about it. And we need to make sure that we can go backwards and forwards by first understanding the existing system's strengths and weaknesses, and then using that information to now inform the design of the next system. Once again, most organizations don't do this, and it's a very big lack in terms of how they come through. So we look at governance around this, and we see that data leadership starts out in governance. People start talking policies, and eh, they eventually get the sense that Data improving over time gradually is good, but we could do better by having some specific data improvement projects that speed up that process, getting better feedback, putting in place resources that we can now prove that when data things happen, we are also having organizational things happen. This is monetizing at its most basic level, saying that, well, it's nice to have a reorganized database, but it's better to have more delivered targeted ads in this and that these targeted ads have a cost. Data architecture components make better targets of re-engineering and digitization efforts by focusing them in with something we call a lighthouse metaphor, which is that there are certain things that will further organizational strategy. There's certain business use data that can be improved and there's additional skills that need to be held. That's a very good sweet spot to focus in on these exact projects as we talk about them here. The components that are making up our data community consists typically of leadership, stewards, others, and something we call subject matter experts. 
most organizations draw this yellow circle and dots around the left-hand side and say that's our data governance organization. There are other variations, but that there's a set of resources that come in from the top that leadership is important to make sure happens. They're receiving some feedback. They're making some decisions and asking the stewards to help implement those decisions so that we can take some action, make some changes to the existing environment. Again, getting some feedback from that process, whereas new ideas come back in and guidance uh, in order to do this. It's a relatively unstructured project, and it's bespoke for each and every uh, organization. They're different, in other words, for everybody else, but that these data architecture grounds all of these conversations. It's in many ways what I describe of the firehouse metaphor of data governance. Yes, sometimes we're sitting around reacting to things, grabbing our jackets off it and going off and fighting the fires. Uh, but sometimes we need to be really creative about the process or the MacGyver approach. Harmless. Remember MacGyver is a guy who can fix anything with paper clips and duct tape. But we also are going to be doing proactive and reactive things in order to do this. Again, first reverse engineering the existing systems to understand their strengths and weaknesses and using this information to design the new system. See, the focus here is that most organizations look at all their data and say, how should we govern all of this data? And I really contend that that is the wrong question. The proper question instead should be, should we include this data item within the scope of our data management practices? And regardless of the answer, document the decision as to why that would be the case. It's kind of like defensive driving. If you've ever sat on one of these devices, it's called a convincer. The convincer simulates a five mile per hour crash. And if you've ever experienced one of these, you'll never not wear your seatbelt. You will always buckle in having done it just once. And that's at five miles an hour. In defensive driving, you're taught all of this and that becomes lifetime behavior. We need to do the same thing in organizations so that they can also learn to do all of these pieces in here because most organizations approach data as a project rather than a program. Your data program is going to last at least as long as your HR program in your organization. And that's an important driver to make sure that your organization understands that. There's some components here that we'll get into. We don't have time in this particular one, uh, data literacy pieces, but we can, we already heard the elevator store a little bit. Uh, there's data stewardship components. You've got to be able to demonstrate value. You need to stay current. You have some fiduciary responsibilities. And most important, realize that everybody in the organization is swimming in the same swimming pool. And if somebody makes the swimming pool water less quality, they can ruin the experience for everybody uh, in here. The problem with this is that most people externally to this group do not understand this. Sure, we've got everything else data, we've got governance and architecture uh, in here, but they don't get it. So just call the whole thing your data program externally, and that way you won't have everybody focusing in on these external pieces. Because if you're trying to explain too much detail to people, you'll get typed cast as a data dink. That would be me, by the way. Uh, I don't know if Scott calls himself a data dink or not, but I certainly call myself a data dink. And most people don't really want to hear these stories uh, in here. So it's a real, real problem. Don't try and toss out the differences between data governance and everything else that needs to be done. Just say it's part of our data program and everybody needs to be a part of it because you're all knowledge workers. So let's review briefly before we get back to the top of the hour here. Uh, again, in terms of what's going on here, data has a lot of confounding characteristics, and this has made it difficult in the past for us to explain these things, to have good analogies that we can use to explain, and to make sure that everybody has at least a basic level of data knowledge. Once again, I blame the college and university curriculums soundly for this, but unfortunately we're faced with a zero sum game. And unless we can figure out which is not important to teach anymore, we're not gonna get more data curriculum 
into the uh, uh, data into the curriculum in here. Uh, you may say, well, data science, doesn't that help? Well, let's be really frank. Most data science programs are statistic programs that have been rebranded or operations research programs that have been rebranded. Not that either one of them are bad characteristics, but neither of them teach the business value of the topic that they're doing uh, in order to do this. I have run across many instances where data science programs produce really smart graduates who, if they understood more about the business, could be more valuable to them. But the typical data scientist takes three years before they're able to demonstrate a positive return on their three years of salary in their organization, and some not even as a result of three years. As a result of all of this missed stuff, and let's not be too harsh on everybody. Our discipline's only about 250 years old. If I go back to Lady Ada as our founding uh, godmother, if you will, of, of the data world in here, uh, it's not surprising that we aren't as mature as we are at building uh, bridges, which has been around literally for millennia, or the pyramids, which were many millennia in this case. Uh, we've been selling beer to each other for at least 8,000 years that we can track uh, on this. So finance outlives both of these disciplines for a lot uh, on this. But it is a, a relatively new idea. And if you want to get started, the data management body of knowledge is a great place to take a look at in this. Now we've defined data governance as managing data with governance, excuse me, with guidance, but also when we get a little higher up in the food chain, it's managing data decisions with governance, which demonstrates the need to have an elevator pitch so that you can explain this to everybody who needs to know. Everybody can understand managing data with guidance is a good thing uh, on this. And that one of your goals around this is to reduce the cost of organizational data debt because they are increasing at an increasing rate. And if you know anything about continuous compounding, you know that that's a problem and that it requires an adaptive approach because each organization is going to be facing different challenges because they've all put their IT infrastructure together in different fashions. Then defining data architectures here, it is ubiquitous as in every organization that is well functioning or at least functioning on a regular basis, they exist, but most are not well understood. And we need to keep the improvements driven by strategic objectives. And a necessary but insufficient component of an architectural, uh, of an architecture in general and a data architecture and specifically is a focus on strategy. Faster, better, cheaper, or less risky is what has to be there. And we can't make use of them if we don't understand what they are in order to do this. And that strategic focus on this helps to improve both the focus of data governance and the goals of data architecture. Again, upending the traditional approach, looking at it as a defensive driving type of an exercise. We're trying to put skills in place that will continue throughout their lifetime. And finally, storytelling uh, around all of this is extremely helpful because we can now get people to do this so as we get ready for our takeaway Q&A session here, let's just do a quick couple of takeaways before we invite Scott back on here to do this. The need for data architecture and data governance is increasing. Data volume is increasing. Data governance is relatively speaking a new discipline. And you have colleagues like uh, Laura Madsen and John Ladley that are out there saying, I'm not sure data governance is working in its current state. Uh, both of them have written nicely on the article. I'd encourage you to look up some of their work uh, and see what's going on uh, from their perspective. But that either way, we need to conform to constraints and that there is no single best way of doing all of these pieces. That data architecture must become strategy driven. Again, re-engineer components of both your data architecture and your IT architecture as a result of your data governance activities, that they are driven opportunistically, that you need to get practiced with quantifying strategic improvements. Once again, it's very difficult to start out doing this perfectly, but practice over time, and you will, in fact, realize these. I'll just mention a quick resource here. Douglas Hubbard has written a wonderful book, How to Measure Anything, that I found super inspirational in my own work uh, around this, and that you turn this into a programmatic implementation as you're doing this, because having a shared focus 
produces reusable results that you can implement as a program instead of as a project, that you gradually add ingredients just as you do with a recipe, and that you increase the complexity with which organizations approach both of these tasks, much less the process of trying to coordinate the two of these. The value of storytelling is really, really not to be underestimated in this as well. And that the goal all the way around is to improve the overall effectiveness and efficiencies of the data around this. However, the real key for this is that the more literate the organization, the easier the transformations are. And this process of becoming more data literate is something I think that is the purview of all data leaders, helping their organizations overall become more data literate, not just the data people, but all knowledge workers within the organization. This is the single most valuable thing that you can do in order to uh, achieve these goals uh, around this. So we've uh, back to the top of the hour here. Uh, again, a couple of events coming up next month. We're going to do what's in your data warehouse. And then in December, one of my favorites, data management best practices. And then in January, Mark, we start our 14th year together on January 14th. Uh, there's some quick coupons off of uh, uh, the books. If you've got a chance to get over there and grab any of them, but they look interesting at all. But now it's time to invite Scott to come back on and uh, talk to us a little bit more, see what sort of questions you guys have for the two of us. So thank you all for your time and effort listening to this. And we'll turn it back over to Mark. There's some great questions in Q&A here um, that I'm really excited about. And a few of my favorite questions, uh, which Peter, you're starting to get familiar with as well. Uh, but we'll start with this one here. Where do you start implementing architecture at an organization that is just starting to consider architecture? How do you bring such an organization from zero to hero? That's a really tough question. Let's take it in two parts. And again, Scott, I really do want you to chime in on this as well. But uh, first of all, there is one time where you're gonna start off with a blank slate for your architecture. And that is when you have a brand new company. Usually you're in startup mode at that time and nobody has time to sit down and think about architectural decisions because you're concentrating on survival at that point in time. Uh, if you're not in startup mode and the organization isn't thinking about architecture, yes, that is more typical of where organizations fit. And it is harder to get an organization from a one to a two than from a two to a three because they've already gotten to one, uh, excuse me, two, and they understand at least a little bit more about the value of this. So the key to it is to make sure that you understand that whatever they're doing from an architectural perspective, it's going to be operating within this framework here. And again, I just went through it real brief, as is and to be, right? Uh, validated and not validated, and then logical, physical, and conceptual models. And that all of your architecture work is going to occur within this particular constraint set in here. Every modeling change can be mapped to it. And if we don't understand when we change our architectural components, that things can be in fact worse than they are currently uh, uh, here. Like you can add an architectural component that will make things worse. Uh, you have every opportunity to have that occur in this framework uh, if you are not following this reverse or re-engineering process. Scott, any thoughts on that particular piece? How does it get an organization started to think about architecture? I'm going to guess that the uh, slide that you had up before involves a lot of architectural coordination. Yeah, sure does, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you summed that pretty well. I mean, I, what I typically tell organizations to start with is connect the the business outcome with what they're trying to then achieve. And, and you work backwards from, from there, right? You know, I think too often we try to build architectures disconnected from you know, the actual objectives of what we're trying to, to do. And we don't get a chance, especially when we're starting from zero, to do it the right way, right? Start with the outcomes of how you want to be data-driven. What, what questions are you trying to answer for yourself? And then we can start to work our way back into how you actually need to, what are the components you need to actually, you know, successfully get that done. Um, I, I typically recommend that clients start first with just understanding what data they have, right? Like, you know, what, what data is most utilized? Look at like the lineage and dependency graphs to understand, you know, uh, basically where, where I start, right? Like, especially in, a, in, a, in the data governance practice, it's way too broad to just say, I'm going to govern all my data across the enterprise. It just doesn't make any sense. 
right? So, you know, being able to work yourself backwards of you are my most heavily consumed, you know, reports or, or projects or, you know, data dependencies, if you will. And then, you know, being able to understand where those sourcing games come from, where those pipelines come from, et cetera. That's a really good spot of ultimately where you can, you know, focus your efforts. Fantastic. And, and let's even go a step further than that, perhaps, which is that when people look at trying to do the motivation around this, it's oftentimes good to show them a negative example. And it's not necessarily that you want your own organization to do that, but it's usually pretty easy to go back in there. And this is a little sort of weird factoid that we've discovered at DEMA, which is that people get into this space and they do IT work, good IT work for 10 or 15 years. And at the end of 10 or 15 years, they start to realize that, wow, if somebody did the data better, then things would be easier. I'm not promising easy, right? I don't think either of us are, are promising easy, but easier would definitely be a good achievable goal. And consequently, they say, oh, well, Scott, you said data three times. You must be the data person now. And you turn around and look for DEMA and, and resources and discover us and say, hey, this is great. Well, you know, that's a, an awful lot of unproductive time that we've, we've wasted in there and uh, uh, we'd like to do it. I think Scott, something else that you mentioned too is a tenant of what is now called design thinking in the old days. We used to call it structured systems analysis, but starting with the end in mind, what is the objective that you're trying to come up with? Because having that from the customer's perspective, whether the customer is an internal customer at your organization or an external customer, is the thing that is going to drive it as opposed to build it and they will come which has happened enough times in the past that it has become a sad metaphor. We have a, a, a wonderful question in, in Q&A, and then it was uh, asked again in chat here. So I'm going to ask both uh, back to back. Are the data models uh, still useful in the age of APIs? And in chat, it's how do you see physical modeling working in a modern environment where software as a service is commonly used? Uh, you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think I I view APIs as just a, an access layer, right? And so I absolutely believe that data models are still required just because you're putting a, an easier, more kind of uh, self-access way to, to be able to build and an, a, a connection to a data set without potentially a pipeline, right? Uh, doesn't doesn't preclude you from a, a good model design. Uh, and, and most often when when we're working with clients, like it's not it's not enough to to talk about an API over a singular data set. Usually the the formation of uh, whether it's a data product or whatever the end data set is, is a combination of multiple data sets and together, right? And that's that's effectively where the good data model comes into play. So um I, I would definitely not advocate from uh, removing or relaxing uh, the concepts of data model. I think that said, uh, you you can certainly start to to look at uh, aspects of how data models can shift. Because I think a lot of the organization, a lot of organizations struggle with the kind of the being rigid about a data model structure, uh, and then it becomes really hard to refactor things upstream. And so, looking at how you can build, um, you know, basically uh, redundancy or or uh, flexibility in terms of your pipelines and process. So that you can add columns or or, or different descriptors to to your data, uh, this can be a really good good way to kind of mediate some of those concerns. Super, and I would add to that as well, Scott, the idea that when you're dealing with APIs, you're really dealing with a sort of challenge area that says I want to get a specific data item in order to produce it for a result of a business process. However, in most organizations, it's also necessary that your API not just produce the results that it's supposed to, which, you know, again, APIs are super useful from that perspective, but that they produce it in a form that complements the existing business architecture. Uh, I'll give a, a very interesting example here that I found in one organization where they had an API that they were going to replace uh, with a, an existing system. So they were going to say, hey, we don't need to have this system anymore. We can get the data via an API. But the problem was the existing system that they were supporting uh, had a, a uh, nice integrated screen. Again, it was designed with design thinking and had the end user in mind and all the information they needed on one screen, whereas the API was going to require them to spread this information out over 
of more than a dozen screens. And I don't know about you all, but working from a even multi-screen system, having data, you know, disparate over multiple uh, windows makes it very, very difficult to achieve the customer objectives in a timely fashion when you're looking at this information being chopped up very well. So again, I support Scott's answer on that as well. And, and of course, the whole concept of a fabric is a more integrated approach, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's trying to make sure that you can build you know, that concept of a, a data model across different silos of data, right? Knowing that data is going to reside in different places. You know, this is this is the core, core nature of what a fabric is trying to help you with. It's not necessarily saying that uh, centralization is bad or, or you can't put everything in a single warehouse. <clears throat> so it's certainly a, a, a productive uh, a strategy a lot of clients try to use. Uh, but the reality in the world is is that data is going to be dispersed and that's okay. And and especially when or, uh, you know some of the organizational constructs exist in, across companies, you know, where where you know the left hand doesn't necessarily know what the right hand is doing, you know, having the ability to be able to work across these silos is really important. Absolutely. Again, keeping that end goal in mind, but not just an immediate end goal, but more along the lines of focused around strategic objectives. Uh, super, super on that. So we, we do have a, a somewhat related uh, question in Q&A here, uh, which is a great segue, uh, or at least it would be if I stopped talking so much and just asked the question. What other <laughs> aspects of information architecture are most valuable besides data models? Uh, Mark, you might want to jump in on that one because you've done enough of that work, but I'll go back and put our list of models uh, <laughs> just of architectures up. I say that and I'm stumbling over my slides here. Let's see, where is it? Uh, come along, come along. This is hard. I have to look up each of them. There we go. So question is of these, which also are useful beyond the data model. Uh, I find most organizations start out by doing some combination of data and process architectures and connecting the two of them via a uh, what we call a CRUD matrix. If you're unfamiliar with it, we haven't taught them in colleges and universities for years for some reason, uh, but it shows that a, a process, a specific business process creates, reads, deletes, or updates information and that's where the crud comes from uh in in certain fashions i don't have a slide here handy for it um but i'm sure we have a uh can get one of those and i'll add it to the deck here uh, so people can take a look at it uh scott what do you see and, and again mark feel free to jump in as well because i know you've done this as well yeah i think the concept of, the, of security especially as, as it relates to how you're going to to build access policies into uh, you know, consumption patterns, right? I think I think a lot of the times when we think about security, we think of like a, a bad cop, right? And and you know, someone's going to slap your wrist if you're accessing a particular data set, or audit you, right? And, and tell you that you're not having a, a you know the privileges to be able to access that. But trying to to be more you know security by design, right? Where you're you're actually ensuring that. Uh, you know, if, if if a consumer in a particular geography doesn't have access to or shouldn't have access to a particular data set because it's hosted in, in, uh, in say, the European Union, right, uh, you basically set up your teams for success there, right? Uh, because it, you, if you can build as much of that uh, security enforcement into the actual application, into the, the patterns of how you're worrying about uh, the overall storage of your data, like it makes it so much easier for them, not just to enforce it, but for you to actually comply with some of these regulations too. A close vote for security and there certainly endorse that uh, again, particularly since my bank, uh, Bank of America was down over the weekend because uh, they had a little <laughs> oopsie problem around that. Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, as you know, Peter, I'm a, I'm a bit of a process nerd. You and, are. Uh, I, I, I kind of really like that process architecture, but also bringing it into uh, data and data governance and attaching people and roles uh, to, to that as well and kind of tying it all together. So I know who's using what, when, who's creating what, when, and who's responsible for it. And, and then tying that together from a systems point of view so that I can understand owners and, and, um, and, and places and things and, and constraints on things as well. So I kind of I kind of bleed towards that area when it comes to to architecture. And, and I know in because... particular, Mark, you, you've used RACI as a concept quite a bit too. Exactly, exactly. And I, I like um, I forget who did it first. I, I think Bob 
taught taught me this a while ago our, our mutual friend bob signer when he when he said uh, i added like to add a s in for support to a racy matrix so racy is responsible accountability accountable consulted and informed and then i like adding an, an s to 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 a supportive role there so that we can understand who's who in the zoo uh for everything uh along the way so question these are our responses in general you guys are actually the experts at the site which is going to be important facing your organization and all of our answers may not be correct for you you may in fact discover that the technical architecture is much more important uh in there than either of the things that we've just dis discussed so far so we're relying on you all to be the experts of finding out what works best for your organization given the problems that you're facing and have your data governance and data architecture efforts focused towards that particular outcome that's an excellent point, Peter. Um, we do have uh, one of my favorite questions in chat, and it's getting a few upvotes here, so I'm going to ask it. What are some strategies that you would recommend in order to foster a stronger relationship or a strong relationship between data and IT teams within an organization? Ken Scott, IBM's done a lot of work on that over the years, probably more so than any other organization I'm aware of as far as supporting that particular piece. You want to take a crack at it first? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, it goes back to this people process technology, right? You, you were talking about this before and in the survey results, like most of what clients struggle with is honestly not technology, it's people and process, right? And so trying to, to make sure you're setting your teams up for success is really key if you're going to try to actually uh, uh, make your organization more data driven. I, I would say maybe three things that I've seen work. One, we were talking a little bit before in, in your presentation about organizational design. Like I, I wouldn't discount the impacts that uh, organization design has on behavior, right? It's not always practical, but where possible, like embedding teams together is really, really impactful and ultimately can drive the behaviors you're looking for. Um, the second would be the formation of a formal role description of a, of a data steward. You, you talked about this one uh, as well, but like uh, effectively, this is a domain owner, right? The, they're responsible for managing the access, the quality, the security, the compliance for a particular asset. I, I loved your an analogy of, you know, I'd rather have a full person, you know, focused on it, even if it's one versus, you know, 10 different people with 10% of their, of their capabilities or, or, or capacity, right? So, you know, actually, you know, graduating and having a, a formal role description of a steward that's going to maintain this data asset uh, for your consumers is really, really important. And then the third I, I would suggest would be looking at the concepts of, of like a data product as an example, right? Where you're trying to build a set of contracts or, or expectations of how data is going to be used or consumed to try to make it a little bit easier for the you know, data teams and, and the IT teams to work better together and have clear expectations of ultimately how you're going to achieve that business outcome. Really good advice, everybody. I hope you wrote down what he said because uh, I don't think I can add too much to that. So, uh, Mark, why don't we move to the next question? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a, a question here in chat that uh, that I think you'd be well suited to answer, Peter. Uh, Dama says data strategy should drive the IT strategy through the business strategy. Is your presentation in alignment with that, or is there any difference that you would want to highlight? I'm not sure what they mean when Dama says, because uh, the Dimbox <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> uh, right, doesn't actually address it in that specific formally, but I think I'm in line with the, the question that's asked. Uh, I'll go back to that little section of the presentation here, uh, stalling while he scrolls through the slides sequentially, unfortunately. Oh, come on, where is it now? Uh, I should just put it up and do a search, but that would be awkward on the screen. Uh, let's see, but uh, yeah, I, I, again, uh, there we go. Uh, the, the component here is that uh, the way this has traditionally been done in the past is that we had an organizational strategy and then an IT strategy and the data strategy came out of the IT strategy because data was seen as an IT asset and therefore managed by IT. Uh, this is wrong. Thank you, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and uh, my contention here is that the IT strategy, I don't try to make this too strong of a point, but you can see the arrow pointing from data strategy is of greater weight in PowerPoint, if you will, uh, than the uh, IT pointing back at the data strategy. After all, what is the purpose of your IT strategy other than to deliver data? And the data is what feeds your business processes. In their notice, when we were asking about what 
architectures are important, uh, none of us really said the IT architecture is key to this. And don't worry, it's important. If it doesn't work, it's necessary, but insufficient. Uh, again, organizations that uh, do things like uh, Delta did for a while, where they had all of their customer service and their pilots accessing the same 800 number to find out schedule changes. Uh, when you have a downtime, that doesn't work out so well. And Delta's learned from that mistake and, and changed uh, very significantly around it. But that's not a... a, a you know, a huge architectural component. That's just a little bit of bad design thinking in the process there. Scott, any thoughts on that? No, I I, I don't know how I could do it more justice than you just did, Peter, but I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about before, which is, again, ensuring that you can start with the outcome, right? And if you can start with the outcome and, and form ultimately the data strategy, having the larger larger view of uh, how you want to set up the organization, how you want to set up your IT practices and, and design, like this is this is ultimately setting you up for, for better success. There's a saying, and Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything to that uh, in there, but uh, always design a chair for a room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget which designer it was that, that said that, but you know, if, 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 if you're just designing a chair absent the context in there, it's going to be very difficult. This is what, what you're describing, Scott, in terms of designing with the end in mind, keeping focused on here and, and trying to figure out what works best. Mark, any thoughts? Uh, just the, my one saying that I, that I like to repeat every once in a while, only use something for the purposes it was designed for. Um, Cause often we'll see at organizations uh, things being used, not the way it was designed and uh, mistakes end up happening that way. So uh, whether that's an entire architecture being um, perverted to serve a different process that it wasn't designed for, or an individual data field being co-opted to store some data, uh, uh, just, just that's always a bad idea. <laughs> it never ends up working well. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for for one more uh, question here, and and I and there there's a really good comment in chat that I think we could uh, chat about a little bit here. We may have missed mention of the role, influence, and accountability of a data owner. Um, what are your thoughts on on data owners? Scott, I'm a little controversial on this. So I'll let you go first. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, when I when I think of a data owner, I I typically equate them to to a data steward, um, and and this this may be the 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 wrong assertion. And again, like you know, the your, your mileage may vary depending on how you want to set up uh, your definition of these of these different roles. But I ultimately think that a a data owner needs to be responsible for how that data set is utilized across the organization. And so you'll see a lot of crossover, in my opinion, with you know the roles and responsibilities that we would typically uh, lump underneath a data steward persona, uh, which is again, you know, understanding not just the upstream use cases, but understanding how the data set should be used responsibly. Uh, you know, who should access it? Is it up of up, up the highest quality, et cetera? And so I think at, at the end of the day, like these these two these two uh, you know concepts of, of data owner and data steward are, are very similar in my view. Certainly concur with that. Mark, any thoughts? Before, I think I know what you're going to say, Peter, but before you get on that train, <laughs> I, I do like to to really be clear about what I mean by data owner when I start talking about data owners, because I think it's a, it's a set of words that carry meaning that might not impact what I want it to. Really, what I'm talking about when I say data owner is the person who is ultimately accountable for the data at the organization. So are they the sponsor for... Uh, that uh, that one system are they you know this chief operating officer of a of a manufacturing plant and are they responsible for the bill of materials being correct or like are what is their uh, level of accountability when it comes to the organizational data are they where the buck stops is kind of like how I like to think of a of an owner. I like everything that both my colleagues here have said about the concept. The only thing I really quibble with is the actual use of the word owner. Now, the reason I put the slide back up here is because when you're doing process architecture, you must have process owners in order to do this. And it seems only natural, therefore, that you should have data owners. But the problem with having a data owner, again, roles described by both Scott and Mark here, I agree with 100%. But when you give somebody the title of owner, they should own a process 
data is a shared resource. And I find it's been one of the most harmful concepts to introduce into data governance organizations. And, and I translated as Scott exactly did straight down into that's a steward and that's a person who has responsibility. And in particular, I add fiduciary responsibility for the data as it's used. So the way I like to say it is if you must own something, if you have a culture that says somebody has to own something in there, allow them to be the business data requirements owner. They own the requirements and they can only own those requirements from the part where the data enters their well-defined business process until it leaves their well-defined business process. Because you wouldn't want an owner of data in a manufacturing environment to own that data as it travels onwards into finance and accounting uh, in order to do that. It's a quibble. And, and again, it doesn't make me very popular because a lot of people like to have that term ownership out there, but I do find it's a very harmful role. And I like to go say, let's, if you want to own something, you're a data requirements owner, but uh, absolutely it is in fact, one of the major roles of the stewards uh, within the governance organizational structure. So hopefully I haven't made any enemies on this call from my two colleagues here. Well, no, uh, that's, that's kind of why I like to define that first, because I want to dissuade people from thinking it means something that it doesn't. A friend of a mutual friend of ours, Peter, calls that role a trustee, like a data trustee. And for I'm sorry, say it one more time. Reasons, a data trustee. Mark, are you still there? Yep. Oh. Yeah, they like to call it a, a data trustee, which which is an interesting uh, verbiage on that. And I think kind of achieves the same sort of uh, goal that you're kind of uh, talking about there, Peter, where you're you're talking more about different types of responsibility than uh, than what the, the word owner may imply naturally. Um, any last thoughts before uh, before we end it for today? Scott? I uh, know nothing on my side. Yeah, thanks for the thanks. For the great session, Peter. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. And, and that's all we have uh, on the schedule for today. So thanks again for attending. And we'll have the presentation and, and recording and slides out within a couple of business days. And uh, thanks again. And have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody.